Good afternoon uh, or good morning, everybody, and welcome to a special webinar that we put together hastily to discuss the the events of the last five days, and we have an all-star group of panelists here to discuss this. Anyway, my name is Peter Renton. I'm chairman and co-founder of Fintech Nexus, and I'm going to be leading the discussion. And we, as I said, we have a great group of panelists. Why don't we um, start by uh, just doing quick intros? So tell us a little bit about what you do and where you are calling in from. I'm going to go left to right on my screen here and start with you, Ryan. Good morning. It's Ryan Gilbert, um, founder at Launchpad Capital in Oakland, California. We're an early stage financial services and technology focused venture capital firm. Okay, Shamir. Hi, Shamir Karkal, uh, co-founder of Scylla. We are an API platform for fintech and crypto companies to do payment processing. I also co-founded a neobank called Simple back in the day. Um, and yeah, I've been hanging around in, in fintech for a while now. Okay, and uh, Conrad? I'm Conrad Alt. I'm a partner and co-founder of Claros Group. We're an advisory firm working with fintechs and, and banks. All right, and last but definitely not least, Joanne. Hi, everyone. I'm Joanne Barefoot. I'm CEO and co-founder of AIR, the Alliance for Innovative Regulation. We're a nonprofit working on how to make bank regulation and supervision work better through technology. And uh, like Conrad, I'm also a former deputy controller of the currency. Okay, well, we have uh, a, a really good mix here of, of different voices. And we're going to launch right into it. And because I know some of, some of the people here have banks uh, have bank accounts at Silicon Valley Bank and went through this uh, this very torturous uh, few days. So um, why don't we start? I'll start with you, uh, Ryan. You um, you know tell us a little bit about or just a little bit about your personal journey over the last five days. Great. Well, firstly, my heart goes out to everybody who works for that institution. All eighty five hundred of them, great allies and friends of so many of us in the venture and to, and fintech ecosystem. And I hope that they find a good future ahead of them. The uh, the, the story for us started Thursday morning um, at about 9 a.m. when a bunch of our portfolio companies started pinging, texting, emailing, saying, we're leaving the bank. And our response here at the firm was, what's going on? Are you, are you really that crazy? But there was the proverbial canary in the coal mine moment that something was, was happening. And by about 11.30 a.m., following calls we made to the bank and, and to others, we decided that the most important thing for us was to secure capital that the fund had on account at, at the bank um, to get to under the, the FDIC limits of $250,000 and wire out to other accounts at other institutions. What was harrowing about that experience is that there was very little data to work off. Um, and, and when you push a wire, we typically know wires move quickly within seconds or minutes to get that fair reference number. In our case, five wires took five hours and wow. a number of phone calls and emails in between to senior management at the bank. Now, we, that happened to us, and we're very well connected when it came to that institution in particular. So for the thousands of others, it's really clear why so many wires were held up all the way through Friday morning and over the weekend. Um, you know, the, I feel right now we've, we've got through the worst. If we have funds at the bank, we have we off, have money at the safest bank of, in, in America. It should be the new bank of America. Um, <laughs> right. But uh, a lot was learned. And um, it, it's made everybody understand, I think, a little more how the banking system works and and better planning for the future. Right, right. And um, Shamir, I know you're also one of those people um, with a, a, a bank a bank account at Silicon Valley Bank. Tell us, uh, tell us your experience. So I think I was a little bit later to this in some ways uh, than uh, that maybe Ryan or some other people. I got the news kind of mid morning on Thursday. Um, immediately jumped on Twitter and, and all the, uh, the other uh, communication mechanisms. For us, the interesting thing is that we uh, have a capital line, a line of credit essentially from uh, Silicon Valley Bank. And, um, and, and as part of our agreement, uh, we're required to keep most of our money at, uh, at SVB. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us, it was kind of this thing of like, hey, uh, do you do you move the money out and and then try and break your covenant or do you uh, or do you just uh, sit tight and and um, and we had a couple of options uh, but we eventually just decided to sit tight at least on Thursday 
Um, on Friday, we made the decision to start moving some of the money out, but all our kind of wire requests just got clogged. I think we had the pretty much the same experience uh, at that point that that Friday did, except it uh, in the middle of it, we got the news that the FDIC had seized SVB um, and then went into this like, okay, what happens to the rest of our money? And I, it was pretty nail biting over the weekend. Uh, mm -hmm. there was, uh, you know, there was this like, Hey, we're going to get access to enough money on, uh, on, on Monday, but will that be enough to make payroll? <laughs> uh, the, the other interesting thing that happened to us was that, uh, for us last Friday was, uh, was payday. So we are on a biweekly schedule. Um, and there was a payroll run that was supposed to process on Friday, uh, Basically, no employee got their money on Friday because we process uh, through a company that did its uh, payroll processing with uh, with SVB. <laughs> uh, and so another sub uh, kind of sub thread through this was, you know, people on the team were uh, were on the phone with them trying to figure out, hey, when is uh, uh, well, when is the employee's paychecks going to come through? And and then talking to employees on the flip side and saying, hey, hold tight, the, we're you know. We expect that the paycheck will get processed today, but uh, you know people are in different situations, right? Like some people were really. I think it's it's good that it was mid month and not end of month, and and people were like, yes, we don't have, we're not worried about making rent or uh, or, or, or 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 other things, but you know, uh, some people were quite candid about like, I'm not sure I can get through the weekend without this right. uh, without this paycheck, right? And uh, and I offered to backstop folks who were were in that situation. Um, at the end of it, the, everybody in the employee base got paid between somewhere on Friday evening and Monday morning. And I, it really just comes down to like <laughs> how ACH is processed, but uh, everybody was, was able to get paid with anywhere from a few hours to a weekend of, uh, of delay. Um, and, uh, and, and then by, you know, by Monday morning, it was clear that as Ryan said, uh, we we were now banking with the safest bank in America. Mm -hmm. um, our wires did get processed uh, between Monday and Tuesday, um, and then we're now working on alternate bank relationships and, and sort of diversifying. Um, but yeah, but at the moment, it's, it's it's kind of weird because it feels like SPB is back and functioning fine, um, right. and with the with and and is effectively you know uh, run by the government and. And it feels like this is now safer than at least a few other banks in the country. Right, for sure. So, Conrad, I want to turn to you. I mean, as someone who's spent decades in, uh, you know, looking at um, at the banking system and working even with failed institutions, what what did you think? And how you, I know you have accounts at SVB as well. So, what were you thinking over the over the weekend? Well, you know, with regard to accounts, I'll, I'll confess that I was probably less uh, focused on our accounts and less proactive in that way than than Brian and Shamir. I think it was sometime on Friday when it sort of suddenly dawned on me, hey, wait a second, we've got some money at SVP. Um, we're, you know, we're a very small company and it didn't take me long to work out that, um, you know, we would be able to make our next payroll within the deposit insurance limits. So there was not an immediate crisis for us. And um you know, I didn't know what the future was going to bring, but I figured there would be enough time to work it out. And I'm confident we would have done so if if the government had not changed course. You know, we did go uh, on Friday. We, we, we started the process of opening an account at another bank. Um, and we've since completed that process. But I think we're now in this position. Well, we, you know, like, why would we move money there? It's it's perfectly safe at SVB. From an operational perspective, um, I think we did have some issues. We use a, a third party to help us manage expenses, and we were having some difficulties with expense reimbursement. That seems to have resolved as of this morning. So as, as far as I know, at this point, the relationship is fully functional and you know as safe as it could possibly be. So mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't think we're under any pressure to move anytime soon. Right, right. So Joanne, I want to turn to you um, as someone who's sort of, uh, you know, you've been um, you know, the deputy control of the currency, and I feel like you know this. No, there's not enough talk. I don't think about this issue, but wasn't this really a failure? I mean, regardless of the SVB and their risk management policies, wasn't this a failure of regulatory oversight? So, 
Obviously, the situation is still unfolding. We're learning more every day, every hour, sometimes about what was going on there. And as happened with many of these kinds of situations, I think there was a convergence of factors and there's going to be a lot of blame to go around. Clearly, the bank made some errors in what it was doing. It seems very clear. And I think clearly the supervisors missed some things. Um, we've got the the people concerned that the Fed sent mixed signals on interest rates and this bank made the mistake of uh, believing rates were going to stay low and underestimating the macroeconomic environment. Um, I do think there's a strong argument that a lot of the risks that we're building up were fully visible. Um, we know more and more about the explosive growth of this bank. Uh, it was obvious that they were invested in the long-term treasuries and, um, and mortgage obligations. Uh, we knew that the federal home loan bank advances were very significant um, and had developed quite quickly. Um, and a lot of other factors were there for supervisors to see. But at the same time, I think in terms of the contagion to the system, uh, a lot of that is less obvious, and, and I hope we can come back to this as we talk today, but regulators, uh, one of the reasons that my organization exists is that uh, we think regulators don't have good enough information, and we don't know, if anyone on the panel knows, I would love to hear it, how much of the commercial deposits in the country are uh, above the insurance limit today. And how much of that is in small and regional banks? Because the regulators have some insight into that and a lot of reason to worry about it. I talked this morning with a former agency head who said that the regulators generally would not know the answer to that question unless they knew the bank was getting into trouble and they had sent somebody in there to sit on it, which is not the case that we had here. So, um, and then the other factor I know we're going to talk about later was just the head spinning speed with which this hit. This is the first failure that really was in a fully social media driven environment. And um, I was watching Twitter Thursday and Friday and it was just going crazy. And, you know, for the regulators to have closed this bank in the middle of the day, which I think by now we all know is not done. You know, you try to close the bank at the end of Friday, not in the middle of the day scares everyone to death that this had to be done so precipitously. So there's going to be a lot of learnings from it, but I do think that the regulators will undoubtedly be looking back and um, self-critiquing and other people will be critiquing them as well. Right, right. Okay, so um, Conrad, I want to turn to you and talk about, um, you know, you've, you've worked with a lot of bank failures. I know when we were chatting yesterday, you said you worked in the, the SNL crisis of the 80s um, with uh, some of those failed institutions. What is it like, how is this different? And what, what can people expect? How is this going to, to play out over the next few weeks? Yeah, so, so for the depositors at, SF, at SBB, I mean, the, the good news is that the FDIC um, has a pretty well-oiled machinery for dealing with these situations. And um, I think as of today, as we just talked about a little bit ago, things seem to be operating normally. And there's every reason to think they will continue to operate normally while you know, the, the institution remains um, uh, open under FDIC management. Over time, they will look for an acquirer of the institution, either in whole or in pieces. But, you know, when you think about a bank, and somebody explained this to me a long time ago, and I've always liked this, you know, what you really have to think is it's just a big pile of assets and liabilities, and it takes mm -hmm. people to manage those assets and liabilities, and they've got operations to manage those assets and liabilities. So somebody will come along and acquire the deposits of Silicon Valley Bank, maybe just the deposits, maybe other stuff too. But you know, the people and the processes that manage those deposits, they're just going to go along with that acquisition. And it should be essentially seamless for all of SVB's depositors. You know, I, I think there's an, another question you might be asking, which is about, you know, what about depositors at other banks? And I think um, you know, the, the good news for depositors everywhere right now is that um, it seems as if uh, the federal government is more willing to extend deposit insurance to ostensibly uninsured deposits now than they seem to be a week ago. So I think everybody's deposits are a little bit safer this week um, than they were back then. 
Right, right. Yeah, for sure. And if and obviously if they had this back then, there would be no SVB failure. Um, but um, so uh, Shamir, I want to turn to you. Um, you're, you're a fintech company and, you know, you've, you know, you, you, what are you going to do now? I mean, there's the Silicon Valley bank was unique in the, in the fintech space in the tech space overall that, that was so intertwined with um, in pretty much, I mean, every fintech company I know pretty much had a, an account at SVB and there isn't like a direct equivalent. Um, what do you do now? Uh, we're, still, we're still working that out, uh, Peter. So I can't give you like, uh, like an answer saying, hey, uh, this is where we are going to move to. Um, and uh, we're, we're, in the process of opening accounts at, uh, I believe, two other banks, maybe even a third, um, and uh, and and that's one of the things, right? Like uh, one of the greatnesses of SVB is that they understood startups and uh, would you know uh, did actually open an account for us whatever four years ago when we got started and and could do that pretty rapidly and efficiently. Um, and, uh, it's not everybody else who can move at that speed as well. Um, and so, and especially once you get into things like, uh, capital lines, um, flexibility to sort of understand the business, uh, they act as we, acted as a partner bank, uh, and did, you know, uh, ACH processing. And, and I believe they even backed some cards, uh, for some, uh, fintech startups. So it's, uh, all, all our operations are, um, are elsewhere, not on, uh, not on SVB. But uh, you, know, you know, we we're fine as uh, at right now, and over time we will diversify our bank relationships and and uh, and spread it around uh, much more. Uh, but I feel like the if SVB doesn't get taken over by another bank, which is able to kind of re rejuvenate really the brand and the franchise. Um, It'll create a pretty big hole in the in the market, right? Mm -hmm. um, I remember opening my first account with SVB uh, back at Simple, whatever, twelve plus years ago, thirteen years ago, sometime in two thousand ten, I think. Um, and at that point, uh, our first account, I believe, was at Bank of America because Josh, my co-founder, just walked to the nearest branch and opened <laughs> up a business account with them, and we had so many problems as we raise money and try to scale they had that that at least back then bank of america's corporate banking team knew nothing about how startups worked and and why you would suddenly have millions of dollars flowing in and then and then just you know balances would go down for a while and then would go back up and uh and and, and so it was a was, was a pleasure working with uh svb because the relationship managers understood uh startups uh they understood banking as well um, they gave us a capital line back then and, and were very flexible in helping us manage that as we went through an acquisition process. Um, I just I just struggled to think of many other banks in the country who could do that um, and, and have the, the processes and the institutional knowledge to be able to do that. Uh, I hope somebody picks up the franchise and, and continues operating it because it's a huge service to the startup economy. Right. And, and like, Ryan, I want to go to you because, I mean, it's also... Um, the, the venture capital community was very much intertwined with Silicon Valley Bank, and they understood what you guys were doing in a pretty, you know, unique way. So, uh, how how is it from the venture capital angle as far as alternatives? Um, I, I said a few days ago, this is nothing to celebrate. It's you know, some guys made <laughs> made money on shorts, but this is nothing to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And and coming from the Bay Area, where we know a little bit about earthquakes and we measure everything on the Richter scale. <laughs> At least this is a 7.9. That's right. how destructive it's been. The capital core lines of credit and the lines of credit that, the, that our portfolio companies were able to get over the past 40 years were critical and key to the growth of this venture ecosystem. And some may say, oh, well, you were just running this then on LP investments and, and government-backed debt. And my response is, well, that's how many capitalist economies do work. And that's why our venture ecosystem has been able to thrive. As Shamir so well summarized, the extent of the value that Silicon Valley Bank brought to the ecosystem also went beyond capital access. It was an understanding by their bankers of how innovation works. 
It was their willingness to be partners in risk. And I think prudent risk, this is a model that's worked for the past 40 years and also extended to sectors of the economy beyond tech. If you look, drive up to the north to Napa County, where we have our wine region here in Northern California, a significant amount of wineries, many of them startups in their own right years ago, were banked by Silicon Valley Bank. They have a mm -hmm. thriving wine division. In fact, that's a division somebody should buy. Think about all the bottled assets that they have in <laughs> security. Um, in addition to that, they did a lot of work in clean and green energy, which is a key part of our, of our government um, plan in 2023. And you know, reading about the the various um, clean energy businesses and and municipal agencies that work with Silicon Valley Bank tells me how much value they added there. And then you hear stories about charter schools and and medical practices and other real world people driven businesses that backed with the bank, realizing how deep it is. I don't think it's going to be easy for any other bank in this country to step in and fill those shoes. I hope that there will be a coalition of the willing to do that. But it's not going to be the same. And that's what I'm upset about. And I wish everyone the best. Mm -hmm. Right. So one question I have, Peter, and this might be more for Conrad and, and Joanne. Um, I've heard uh, that the, the OCC um, has basically not allowed or, or uh, large national banks to do the sort of relationship-based capital lending that, uh, that SVB did. Right, because honestly, the capital lines that they gave us at uh, at Silla or at Simple, there was no EBITDA to to base those lines on. There was the, the the conventional way that you would underwrite a loan to a small business just does not work with startups. Right, they are amazingly cash flush. They are amazingly not uh, unprofitable, uh, and you and, and the way that SVB did it was based on the uh, the kind of the potential of the business and and the investors and and founders behind it. Right. Um, that's a. I've heard that the OCC is is it doesn't allow national large national banks to do that. And if that's the case, can any of them like could could Chase even buy SVB even even if it wanted to? I'm not saying that they want to, but um, if they can't they can't operate the business, that they can't buy it, right? Can we take a swing at that, Peter? Sure. Yeah. So I, I'm not aware of the OCC having a specific requirement, but there are anti-tying rules that could be implicated here. And it's a question of how the OCC interprets those and applies them to national banks. And I, it's, a, it's a good question. I just don't happen to know the answer to it. Um, I think with regard to an acquisition, I, I, I would not expect this to be a substantial impediment. I think it's something that an acquirer would have to work out. And I'm sure in the context of a deal, there would be some understanding, there'd be a period of time to make appropriate adjustments. I would add that I'm not sure either. And Shamir, I've been hearing something similar to what you were saying. Um, you know, obviously an underlying factor in the risk of Silicon Valley Bank was the concentration risk in, in one in industry, even though it's well taken that it's not, you know, all startups by any means. But uh, it is also true that there has been a business model there about deeply knowing that customer. And my understanding, uh, and I, I'm not sure that this is correct, is that one of the reasons it's a state chartered bank is because the OCC would not have been uh, uh, allowing some of the kinds of risk taking Mm -hmm. This boutique type bank, even though it was the 16th largest, 16th largest bank in the United States, it still had at the core sort of a boutique business model about deeply knowing these customers. And as you say, extending uh, relationships to them that uh, were based on know-how uh, about the startup sector and the VC sector. So I do, and I too have heard that this may limit the ability of a, an acquirer that's a national bank, one of the very big banks. A smaller bank can't take the concentration risk, presumably, and a bigger bank might or might not be able to uh, import what's good about this particular bank and without uh, harm, undoing it. Right, right. So, um, Joanne, I actually want to stay with you because I have a, I know you've done a lot of, thinking about this and how how can regulators adapt like what happened here it just it, it happened so fast in real time we were watching this unfold and you went from having you know 
a, a, like a solid bank, which I mean, obviously Conrad, you had some inklings on, but I mean, obviously there were, there was a few things that were out there in, in the public eye, but nothing all that meaningful. No one expected on Monday, when we woke up on Monday, that by Friday, Silicon Bank, Valley Bank would be out of business. Very few people expected that. So it happened so rapidly. And I know that you sort of, you've done some work around real-time regulation. I mean, how do regulators adapt to such a fast moving world? Yeah, so as Rahm Emanuel said, never let a crisis go to waste. Um, <laughs> this is a wake up call that I hope people will take to heart that our regulators need more information and they need faster information. That might not have saved SVB in the exact way this unfolded, but when we think about contagion to other parts of the industry, Again, this question I raised earlier, how much are uh, banks uh, sitting with non-insured deposits? I heard a number and I don't, I'm not sure I should even say it because I'm not sure if it was correct, but it came from somebody very knowledgeable that a very considerable part of the bank deposits in the country are above the insurance limit. And of those, a very high percentage are in small and, and regional banks. And if you are a customer and you have $10 million that you want to put somewhere safe uh, to stay under the insurance you uh, limit, you would need 40 banks. Mm -hmm. If you have $20 million, you're gonna need 80 banks, uh, or you're gonna need mechanisms for, uh, which are not easy today for somehow spreading this across. So, uh, the regulators get this kind of data today, other than on the very big banks, they get this data from call reports. Mm -hmm. Call reports are still quarterly, quarterly reports. Most of the industry is reporting quarterly on risk metrics. And what we have to do is bite this bullet and begin to digitize the information that's in the banks and that is coming to the regulators. So the regulators have something that is full time instead of sampled or little, you know, averages and so on that they're getting in the rolled up reports they receive and they're getting it close to real time. And they can then model risk at that level. Right. I mean, right. One of the issues going on here is that the big banks are required to do all the stress testing and so on. And the smaller ones are not. And, um, you know, there's, there's good reasons for that, and we can debate what the cutoff should be. But you've got plenty of small banks that have their own concentration risk because they're lending locally. And if they have problems going on and it can turn this quickly and cause widespread public loss of confidence, you could have a lot more. I mean, I'm 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 here to join the chorus. The banking system is safe. The regulators are going to you know do what needs to be done to keep it stable. But this is just one of many things that the regulators have blind spots. They cannot see in real time what's going on in this system. Right, right. And that- There's is no reason, I was just gonna say, there's no reason like pretty much every bank in the US and, and credit union is on um, a core processing system now. I don't know of any that aren't. Uh, those are all, maybe they, they are mainframe based cores, they are outdated, but there's no reason why they can't spit out all the data, uh, data on a call report daily. And there's no reason why there can't be an API that just feeds that into the Fed so that instead of trying to analyze call reports once a quarter, they could just look at that daily. And that's, right. that's not that hard to do. Yeah. Can I call a little bit, Peter? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I certainly agree as a former regulator that it would be a better world if regulators had more timely data, but no argument. On the other hand, if you think about SVB in particular, you didn't have to be a regulator at all to spot that there was a lot of interest rate risk at that bank a long time ago. And it wasn't a lack of timely data um, that, that happened. That's not the core problem at SVB. I'm not sure what the core problem was, but, but somewhere in the supervisory process and somewhere in the management process, risk that was readily apparent to outsiders got missed or wasn't taken seriously. And, and that's a flaw in, certainly in the management, and it's also a flaw in basic bank supervision. And I think there, there really needs to be a close look at how did the examination process work at SVB? Who said what, to whom, when, what kinds of actions were taken? Why weren't they sufficient? 
I mean, that's that's the kind of analysis that I think we need to figure out what the what the most important reforms are to prevent this exact kind of situation. But as I say, I agree we need better information for regulators. I agree with all of that, and I'm sure all of that will happen, but it's the contagion risk that falls on top of it. If we had just had a failure of SVB, a lot of people would have been uh, hurt had not we had the uh, the exceptional measures that were taken. But what's going on in the rest of the system? You know, the other one that's been on my mind all week is the Robin Hood GameStop situation. Totally different arena, but a similar problem where a crisis came out of nowhere. The regulators are all geared to be looking for risk where they're expecting it to come from. And then you get a flank attack. You get something you're not expecting, also driven by social media suddenly making people doing uh, things that regulators aren't used to them doing. To stay on top of that type of contagion risk, we've got to have better data and better uh, anal, you know, AI-driven analytics in this system. It's, 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 it's interesting, Joanne, to bring up and, and, and make comparison to Robin Hood. The reality, of course, we're spending $80 billion to reform the IRS and buy better systems and technologies there. When I talk to friends in DC and here in San Francisco who work for the FDIC or other regulatory agencies, and you talk about their technology systems, they are decades behind. And right. if we get $8 billion into the, the banking entities to, to update systems and get and be, then be able to work with real-time data, we'll all be better off. It's a matter of priorities. What I do worry about, though, as, as Conrad pointed out, is would re real-time data have, have saved the situation and have solved the problem? You know, maybe, maybe not, prob probably not, because this was you know, clear and present to others. But I hope also that the broader banking industry um, is, is going to be receptive to change. Um, I think there are so many that are pointing fingers at SVB and others saying it's uh, it's SVB and the VCs and the tech bros to blame. And these are folks who are running you know, 4,900 community banks across the United States. Instead of being divided, we should come together and realize this is an opportunity to build a stronger, more sustainable system that's going to help us all not say, oh, well, because of what happened at SVB, it's going to cost us more. There's a lot of uh, a, a lot of that anger going around now, okay. and I think that has to stop if yeah. we're going to get through this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and the, and the, the, the whole thing is, the whole the, the whole thing is, is this uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollar limit for the FDIC insurance? Uh, you know, I, like I run a I run a small company. We have you know just uh, 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 like thirty plus employees, and we're always over two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And we're, we're like we just don't. Um, we don't go down that that low, and so it. So that means most businesses, many many businesses, put it that way, are going to be over this limit all the time. And do do we now need to have uh, think think about that? I never thought about being over two hundred and fifty k as really having a whole lot of risk. Um, and that now, I think, I mean, Shamir, you were, you were, you were talking about it. I mean, I'd love to kind of get your perspective. Do you do you bank with multiple banks now to stay under that limit? Uh, I think at the moment we are now with the safest bank in the, in the right. US. So we should... Long term. Yes. <laughs> Long term, it's a great question. Um, I think it's, uh, we're going to be exploring uh, sweep accounts a lot more. And, and one of the, uh, the, the, the techniques that people can do, and as, as actually a lot of much larger companies which have, you know, treasury management teams, what they do is just, sweep funds into uh, a money market fund. Uh, now, it's not like money market funds are completely safe either. There is twice in the last 40 years that money market funds have broken the buck. <laughs> uh, but you just have to be careful about picking a fund which is in short-term government securities and, and that's, pretty uh, that's pretty safe, right? And at the moment, actually, those things are offering yields of like 4% plus right. given where right. the short-term Fed rate is. Um, it's a thing that's, uh, it's just, it just, more work it's just more like mental headache more things for a uh, you know a controller at a startup and yes at a 2000 person company definitely you can assign uh, like a couple of people to just manage that process and make sure it happens efficiently um, but it's it's much harder at like a 30 40 50 person company right, right. Um, and uh, and so we'll explore that uh, a lot more and then there's a bunch of startups who are working to automate that. Um, everything uh, from like um, Conrad's old firm, Promontory, had this CDAS product, right? Right. Uh, and yep. then there's 
yeah, there's uh, and there's you know half a dozen new versions of that, and we are going to explore those as well um, as a way to uh, to spread deposits around. But that combined with money market of uh, uh, a money market fund sweep should be where we uh, where we end up probably in a, in a couple of months time. Right. Um, so so Conrad, should we should we have a different different limit for for business than the two fifty k? Well, that's an interesting question. I, you know, there has never been a different limit historically, and um, uh, but I think obviously the issues at Silicon Valley Bank are going to put that question into sharper relief. I think one of the things that's pretty obvious, um, certainly to me, in the light of all the conversations I was having with executives at various uh, SBB customers over the weekend, is you know it, it's simply not a reasonable expectation that the people who manage money for small businesses should be paying attention to the safety and soundness of their bank. I mean, banks are actually notoriously opaque from an investor perspective. Right. Even you know, financial professionals have trouble understanding exactly how safe their banks are. So I think there, there's a good reason to think we, we maybe should take a look at that. Um, and it, you know, frankly, is it a good use of the time of the people that are running our, you know, our startups and small businesses around the country to get sucked up into trying to figure out what the hell's going on in my bank. It right, just right. doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. Anyway, we need to move to audience questions. We got a lot of questions coming in here and I want us to get to as many as we can. Um, okay. So Michael talks about, um, let's just maybe see if I can summarize this. So he basically was talking about um, a bank saying it's against their regulations to require, or it's against regulations to require having all your deposits at the bank as a condition of lending is that is that is that does anybody know if that is i mean it seems like it was in the covenants for svb but is that a, a re, like is that against any regulation like we, we we talked about this earlier and i think both both joanne and i expressed the need to brush up on the anti-tying rules i think it, it, there is a regulatory issue there and i don't know uh, how it was uh, dealt with at svb i'm I certainly don't want to accuse them of violating the regs but it's a good question and i just right. don't know the right okay next um i've said this has been in the press a bit the bank was the uh, silicon valley bank was heavily into esg lending and focused on other issues like dei i mean I think, you know, I'm not going to answer the question. I, I, you guys can. What do you think the impact will be to the investor and lender attitudes towards companies that are focused in these areas? Who wants to take that one? I'll be happy to jump in on that one. Okay. I, I don't think it's going to have any impact. We all know how important it is to focus <laughs> on ESG and DEI. That's, that's, that's the world we live in in 2023. And um, to take pot shots at Silicon Valley Bank because I place an emphasis on that, I think isn't focusing on what's important. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. And, and and I think, I mean, Signature also was was uh, seized by the regulators over the weekend. I don't know too much about Signature. We didn't bank with them, uh, but I just looked at their board of directors, and it seemed to be a lot more like, uh, you know, middle aged white men, right? That didn't save them. Uh, and I remember all the banks that went bust in 08, 09, and like the hundred plus that went bust in, I think three, four hundred that went bust in the last decade. They were mostly run by middle-aged white men. But this this whole idea that DEI has anything to do with it. They had Barney Frank, Shamir. That was they <laughs> thought that was the solution. <laughs> Didn't help. They, they should have got Senator Dodd as well. <laughs> <laughs> Can I add on that one to reinforce yep. what Ryan said before that the finger pointing is going to be terrible. Everybody's going to politicize this issue to make whatever point they were already trying to make. We're already seeing a lot of that. And on this one, a lot of banks emphasize ESG and DEI, banks and companies of all kinds, not because their regulators are forcing them, but because they believe it's a way to build a strong company and they believe it's a way to, to meet the, uh, the customer's needs. Um, there's a big, there's a strong business uh, argument for diversity and, and um corporate responsibility as well. So, uh, yeah. Right. Okay. One for you, Conrad. Um, I fully concur with your comment about the implicit guarantee of uninsured deposits at other banks, extending the explicit backstop of the new bank term loan facility. How do we get that message out to the general public, which based on current market action and account movements is not at all understood? Yeah, so I think that's a really important question. And I think it's a hard one to answer. So obviously, you know, 
people like me, and there are a lot of us, you know, and in, in the private sector as well as the public sector, will keep making the same point. And I hope that that kind of drumbeat has an effect. But I think one of the things we have to reflect on, particularly apropos of the SVB failure, is the the reality that there these conversations go on. A lot of these conversations go on in very disconnected channels, right? So, so I don't know who's putting that message out on Twitter. I don't personally have a lot to do with Twitter. I don't think most regulators have much to do with Twitter. Are they communicating that message? Probably the agencies are in an official capacity, but you know, I, I think you've got different echo chambers here and they don't necessarily talk to each other very well. And I think that's, that's something we probably need to understand a little bit better as we think about how banks are at risk going forward. Okay, next question. How significant was the rather unique nature of the depositor base in the bank? Yeah, relatively small in number, many from a very narrow slice of the economy. Um, in the bank, how, how significant was that in the bank's failure? To what extent did the very clicky nature of this group contribute to the bank run? Could the depositors have considered an alternative? It's a wonderful life scenario in which they collectively worked with the bank that nurtured them to help it navigate a way out of its long securities position. That seems like what for you, man. <laughs> wow. That's wow is my only response. I don't I, I I don't think that the Achilles heel necessarily is this concentrated piece with lots of VCs and startups. Again, I I I'm I think I made clear how diverse, at least from my point of view, the bank was. And I don't think anyone's helped them navigate away from, from any particular problem. Um, either banks similarly have concentration risk, whether in real estate or other large sectors of the economy. Um, and this was a, a bank that was a top performer for, for so long. So um, I think we have to look elsewhere, elsewhere for the source of failure. Can I, can I say a couple of things here? So, so first, I, I, I think it's, um, it's certainly true that having a more concentrated group of depositors, all else equal, puts a bank at greater risk. It just takes less, a smaller number of people to cause a run. And when those depositors are in relatively close communication, and have a similar mindset that probably further increases the risk. So I think there is some sense in which, you know, Silicon Valley Bank was probably more at risk than many other banks of comparable size. Um, and I think those are factors that are kind of hard to manage and, and hard to measure, right? So that's another area where maybe there's some learning for the regulators going forward. But the other thing I want to say, you know, there's been a certain amount of commentary, the effect that it was sort of bad or immoral for people to pull their money from Silicon Valley Bank. And I think it's really important to emphasize, we all, everybody, every one of us, every business, every person, we all have the perfect right to feel comfortable with where our money is. And the decision to pull money in a moment of crisis because you're worried about your future is a completely rational and okay thing to do. And I don't judge anybody harshly for having pulled their money when things were getting rocky. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the yep. things I wondered is whether we should be exploring some kind of a equivalent of a suspension of trading in the stock market short of putting the bank into receivership. Maybe there's a way that regulators could pause uh, deposits, but maybe that would make things worse, you know, I don't know, but. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a great question. And, and just one thing here is people talk about the SVB concentration in Silicon Valley. And I'm like, well, that was the name of the bank. Uh, if you're going to bank small businesses in Silicon Valley, that you, you're going to end up with some startups. It's, it's almost impossible uh, not to. Uh, they did specialize in that to a certain extent, but the real concentration was corporate customers, right? Like SVB had a very, very small uh, individual retail depositor base, right? It was mostly corporates. A lot of them uh, you know, wine growers, charter schools. It's, it wasn't just startups, right. uh, but it was heavily just corporates. And the effect of that was that they ended up with a very, very high um, like amount of uninsured deposits uh, for a bank, which, what was it, 200, 250 billion in, uh, in assets and probably shrunk quite a bit uh, this quarter. But uh, that's not, that, a bank of that size, like you know, top 20 bank probably has a few million depositors. If you look at the others in the 10 to 20 range, SVB had less than 100,000 because it was heavily corporate, right? And I think that made a bigger difference at the end is just that if you're a retail depositor with like $5,000 or, or even the median uh, 
transactional account limit for an individual in the US is about 5,300. The, uh, the average is much higher. It's about 40,000. But for the vast majority of people, FDIC insurance covers them completely. There's no, uh, never any reason to run on your bank. If mm -hmm. you're a medium-sized, even a small business, FDIC insurance doesn't cover you. <laughs> Once you get past like 10, 20 employees, you're probably going to end up more than the FDIC limit. And if you have a, you know, 95% of your deposits are from corporate customers, that's a real concentration risk, yeah. independent of Silicon Valley. There are what, many what, banks that are primarily business focused with predominantly uninsured deposits. That's a that's a very common model in the banking industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What What's also clear here is the, that that na names matter, and if you're going to be called Silicon Valley Bank, you know, I'm sure there's a bank called Bank of Tallahassee and Bank of Sacramento and Bank of all these other towns. They probably have to look at their branding and and, and understand that risk. But similarly, you know, let's let's think about where institutions are located and the markets they're serving. There are new banks popping up all over the country right now, probably about 20 or 30 in formation, in areas where there's been a lot of bank M&A and therefore underserviced. For example, a new institution that, that popped up in, in, in South Florida, I think in Fort Lauderdale. Well, what happens in that region if the Floridian market totally tanks and everyone goes back to New York City? Is there still a need for a new institution? Will deposits and 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 commercial relationships particularly be able to support that? So I suppose um all business is local after all, and that <laughs> is a big concern. Right, right. Okay. Um, another question here. It's actually more of a comment. Get data in real time is getting data in real time is one thing. What about banks being required to assess their assets? in a timely manner yeah because svb's outstanding bonds and treasuries were were greatly overvalued they weren't marked to market that's the basic the bottom line should we should there be changes so, there well hold that thought right i'm like <laughs> um, are we going to mark everything on a bank balance sheet to market all the time are we going to a full mark to market world <laughs> uh, and and i'm like there's the the reason why banks i mean the fundamental business of a bank is to borrow short and lend long, mm -hmm. right? Like that's the role that banks uh, fill in society. It's, it goes back to the whole, it's a wonderful life model. Your money isn't in the back, it's in Joe's mortgage or whatever, right? Um, and, and, and so the, the, the difference was that uh, SVB had a long uh, portfolio held to maturity that was in treasuries that were easy to value on a market. If they had all of that in like individual loans to, uh, to, to I don't know, to mortgages to people, um, I'm sure that's actually historically, it's a more common model is to have a lot of like business customers and then be uh, lending that money out to local businesses in larger chunks, right? Whether it's to your local farm or to mortgages for property and all of that. I'm sure there's still lots of banks which have that model. Um, you, you, you can't just require everything to be marked to market. I think the, the, the accounting rules, I don't think are the, the issue here. And, and there's one simple change by the Fed to say that, hey, we're going to let you uh, collateralize, uh, you know, use securities as collateral at par value. That has completely eliminated the problem that SVB had, which is that uh, as long as its depositors didn't run, it was solvent. The moment the mm -hmm. depositors ran and it became a big enough run, it went insolvent. Mm -hmm. The other thing I mean, that's my opinion. <laughs> the other thing on this is if if we're not marking to market, the regulators need to see that there's risk accumulating there and ratchet up the rest of the scrutiny. Uh, and, and and this was Conrad's point, right? Like even if you look at SVB's like Q4 statements and everything else, it's disclosed in the notes. The like the what the mark to market losses on the HTM portfolio would be, um, and there were traders who picked up on that and went short on SVB, uh, and, I, and I'm sure they did great out of that. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily. It, it doesn't feel like it was something that drove decision making mm -hmm. until last week. So, so the, the problem with mark to market in general is not with the securities portfolio, because as Shamir says, you, you know, the, the losses on securities are in fact disclosed in footnotes to all of the financial reports. And you can figure it out if you really want to. But it is very difficult to mark loans to market because they're much less liquid asset, commercial loans in particular. You know, it's just it's a very difficult thing to do. 
Um, and so you, you're left in a situation where it's hard to mark the entire balance sheet to market. And the current, you know, where we have where we are right now is sort of a compromise on that problem. And I think we'll probably take another look at that compromise, you know, in the aftermath of, of recent events. I do think there's an important question to ask, though, which is why do you have to look at the footnotes, right? Why do reported capital numbers and regulatory capital numbers rely on whether losses are recognized or not, which is really just that that is not about economic reality. It's about pure and simple accounting. And clearly a lot of people get confused. You look at the capital numbers, you say, aha, capital is good. That's actually not true. When interest rates go up, you know, the capital position of the banking industry as an economic matter is weakened. And we all know that. And yet the numbers don't really reflect that, except, you know, if you really dig hard and do the math, it just shouldn't be that hard. Right, right. So interesting question here from uh, from my partner here, Bob Ruskern. Is it possible to create a voluntary private system of reporting and oversight, the API-based system that you are advocating? Is this an opportunity for a private company? Perhaps if we can't trust the government regulators to get up to speed, perhaps we should take this into our own hands. Joanne, you want to tackle that one? I think that's a fascinating question. I do think there's definitely space for more uh, industry-led risk management. I mean, every institution is doing its own risk management, most of them using ancient tools also, and so are the regulators. Um, I do, I think, I mean, I think something we have seen in the last week is that the regulatory role is indispensable and the regulators are the, the regulators plus, you know, counting the FDIC and the Fed are the source of public trust. Um, but I think it's a really interesting question. And I also think the industry should be building these tools. We can call them reg tech tools or digital regulatory reporting type tools and the agencies can be picking up on them. I'll, I'll say one other thing on this too. I think other countries have been more focused on this than the US, uh, maybe partly because they don't have such complex regulatory structures as we have, but I'm gonna be in London next week and the Financial Conduct Authority's been building a dashboard that turns, you know, flags risks in a way that's very, very data-driven. It's far from perfect, I'm sure, but uh, so I'm sort of copping out on the question, but I think it's a worthy conversation to be considering. Let me put it that way. I I see some like initiatives moving towards that in the crypto space, funnily enough, <laughs> that people are like, you know, there isn't any official regulator and folks are like, hey, here are uh, here are standards for things like reporting on on data. And, and you know, uh, if, if you want if people to trust your stable coin, for example, you need to a lot more data on, uh, on on where the where the underlying assets are, um, and also remember this is the history of the banking system. Um, it it wasn't that the you know the 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 king of England woke up one day and decided that banks needed to be uh, regulated. Like historically, like the government and the banks had like a love hate relationship because uh, between them, most of the origin of central banks, whether it's in Amsterdam, whether it's in London actually started as a consortium of bankers getting together to build things like clearing houses and central banks to make a lot of payments processes easier. And then those naturally becoming like lenders of last resort. Because guess what? Between like 1865 and 1907, there was a bank run in the US every seven years on average, because every time there was a recession, there was a bank run. Uh, and the, all other countries had these problems as well. They just got to the central bank solution. And then the government came in and, uh, and, and regulated the central bank. The way the Fed is set up, but the Fed is not actually, well, the Fed's member banks are not actually owned by the government. They're actually owned by the banks that are members of the Fed. This is historically not uh, an, an unusual thing. Like central banks were frequently owned by their member banks uh, because they were they started that way as industry organizations that provided services to the banking industry as a whole and then gravitated towards becoming lenders of last resort to stop a run and then we're like well if you're going to do that we're also going to regulate you because we do you know we're going to lend freely and against good collateral to solvent banks but we need to know who's solvent <laughs> and you need to have a standard for good collateral and 
that all goes back to bag of heart and evolution, right? So um, I feel like we're going back, we have evolved far past that point, and now we are maybe going back to the start of that point again, at least in crypto. Mm -hmm. I, I agree on crypto. I think this is emerging, yeah. So here's an interesting question. Um, is, are there ways to regulate a bank run out of existence? Because it's, it's going to happen again, potentially. And it's just that in the Twitter age, it doesn't take much. What would have been SVB's alternative without the bank run occurring? What, what would his chances of surviving have been? I'd say very high, wouldn't you? Yeah, I, I think it probably would have been high, assuming that they you know, became focused on working their way out of their you know, they, they were in a very difficult position with their securities book, and they needed to think about how to manage their interest rate and duration risk. But they, you know, absent a run, they would have had time to do that. I'm sure there would have been regulatory support to do that. And they they very likely could have turned the situation around. You know, and, I'm sorry, the, the part of your question about a bank run, how about, can you say that again? Is there a possible way, is there a way to regulate a bank run out of existence? Like, can we ban yeah, and bank runs. So, so I think that the classic way to deal with that is to provide deposit insurance, right? And so, you know, deposit insurance for everybody might be a good solution if you're if the thing you're most concerned about is bank runs. I think one of the interesting things, though, that we're we're witnessing in the last few days is that you see a lot of concern among people whose deposits are already insured, and and that's a really interesting problem, right? Because there is not a bank today, and there probably never has been or will be one where if all the depositors show up in a panic and say, give us our money, the bank could do that, even if it's fully insured, even if it's fully capitalized. I mean, that's just not the way a bank is constructed. And so what you're talking about today is, is really the management of uninformed panic to a significant extent. And that's a, that's a really interesting problem. And I think it has a lot to do, I, I worry that it has a lot to do with some of the kind of the, the, the fear-based conversations that we see in the general media yeah, now in fact, some of our financial management conversations, and we got to really think hard about how we police that. Peter, every event has a sponsor, and some folks have already printed T-shirts saying the Silicon Valley bank run of 2023 as if it was a fun run. I think the sponsor of this run was fear, and the fear right. was driven by an absolute lack of communication that was louder than what was being um, effectively trumpeted over social media and other act actions. The first time anyone heard anything from any spokesperson or representative of the federal government was Sunday morning. That's when the Secretary of the Treasury spoke. Prior to that, the, the, the White House press secretary and a member of the Board of National Economic Advisors just referenced back to regulators. And the way to stop this from happening short of regulation is by proactive action and getting out there and speaking about it and calming things down. It's also clear that a majority of people don't understand how the banking system works and what federal deposit insurance means. That right. would have gone a long way. But if, 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 if this is a battle of messaging, the government lost. Right. And, and yet, sure. when you look at what the government has done, you've got the president, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, the secretary of the Treasury, chair of the FDIC, all kind of presenting a united front. You know, we're going to take this dramatic action. And if we need to do more, we'll figure that out, too. Right. You, you really can't ask for a lot more than that. And yeah. yet it clearly has not succeeded in calming all of the fears out there. So, well, it has it has stopped. I mean, if they didn't do that, I think the contagion on Monday would have been oh, horrendous. Absolutely. And yet look at the market jitters today. Right. Sure. But they only started speaking on Sunday. Yeah. Thursday right. happened. Absolutely. Should Friday happened. happened. Saturday happened. Yeah. There was more conversation on Twitter and, and 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 certain WhatsApp groups than there was coming out of, of, of the White House. Right. That's right. not you forgot, you, forgot, you forgot Slack groups, though, right? Yeah, Slack groups, Slack, Slack groups, groups yeah. as well. Private, and, private and WhatsApp funny, groups. Right? <laughs> anyway, yeah, um, you... audience, can I just say, we need to realize that in the widened lens on this, the whole sector is on its back foot, you know, big tech is unpopular, fintech is in trouble, crypto's in winter. We had FDS and Zam Bankman fried then Silvergate failed. Then Silicon Valley Bank failed, then Signature Bank failed. All of this is happening during the layoffs in the tech sector. And then there's a whole political machine that wants to attack this whole world, the rich VCs. The, I mean, some of the, the 
vitriol that was in the Twitter debates over the weekend, just the people deserve, you know, to fail if they were too, stu you know, they're, they're billionaire wannabe startups and they're too stupid to get their money insured and they deserve to go down. And, you know, it's called, it's, it's in the culture wars now. Yeah, yeah. And I think everyone needs to be very mindful of uh, the need to be doing our part to be responsible, ethical, um, and alert in both the business side and the government side, yeah. uh, take the good things that are going on in this innovation world and make the best right. of them. Joanne, let me throw one at you. I'm not allowed to talk about this because I wasn't born in America. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's that the best one too. I've got. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Oh my God. So you have no understanding of no, no, yes, anyway. But on that, on that um, funny note, we are going to have to close. Um, really appreciate you, um, Conrad, Ryan, Joanne, Shamir, really appreciate your thoughts here. Thanks to the audience. Sorry we couldn't get to all your questions. Um, some really great questions there. Hope you found the discussion useful. I know I certainly did. And before we go, quick plug we have uh, fintech nexus usa happening in new york may 10th and 11th where this conversation will certainly continue on that note uh, i wish you all a good afternoon thanks very much everybody thanks thank, thank you, you. Thank you.